So here we are again today. We've just had the nuclear posture review. Um, and then we had the nuclear citizen summit, the, the nuclear security summit. And next month is the nuclear non-proliferation treaty in New York, which I will be attending. But the question, I mean, I'm sure you all get that this is completely bizarre and insane, hence the nuclear mystique. Now, he translated on the centrifuge, interesting, because in the meantime, two other sources of motivation had taken place. As a Muslim, he was concerned with the Palestine flight, deeply concerned. And he looked around the world and found that civilizations had bombs, and took up the Zulfiq and Bhutto slogan of the Islamic bomb. In other words, it was a combination of a Muslim and a Pakistani dedication that was brought to, one can say, fruition by a fluke of coincidence of hiring a polyglot, brilliant young student from Utrecht for a summer job. If anybody should be blamed in this connection, it might be the people in Euratom who hire guys for summer jobs. They have never been mentioned. So having said that, he took photocopies at night. And his translation job was compatible with that. Whether he brought them by hand back to Pakistan, or they simply mailed them, I don't know. But the rest of the story culminated with the Islamic bomb. So if we now make a survey, we can see that each civilization has one, with one glaring exception. And that's the only civilization that was a recipient of an atomic bomb, the Shinto civilization. In the Pacific War, Amaterasu Mikami, the Sun Goddess, was beaten by a god whose permanent 724 resonance is in Washington. And the result was a submission that had to have an expression. And the expression was not exactly heavenly, but it pointed upwards, a nuclear umbrella. In other words, the idea that Shinto could be shielded by evangelical Protestantism and find a suitable place. Now, this has been disputed by the Japanese right wing. And when they, who at the same time are by and large very pro Washington, argue a Shinto bomb, it's in order to join the club. This club is well known. We have had instances of that club before. And I think the most important one was the club of colonial powers. When Spain, for instance, was busy in northern Morocco, later on under the leadership of a young, brilliant, ambitious general with the name Francisco Franco, was in order to seek membership in the club. The ruling club is the club of those who rule other peoples. You can say that with the demise of colonialism at the end of the 50s, early 60s, the triumph of nuclearism got a major impetus. A new club had to be perfect. And the club, of course, immediately coincided with a third club, membership in Security Council, with a veto power. Now, there is something veto published about nukes that makes for a kind of fortunate coincidence, but several civilizations were excluded. And those are civilizations that felt they had the message for humanity of such a kind that the elimination of that country, for whatever reason, 
that would be the stronghold of the civilization it would be a disaster not only for that civilization but for humanity that of course brings us immediately to the category chosen people with the promised land and that category originally Judaic was taken by Cotton Mather and John Winthrop among the pilgrims and was appropriated by the US and has stayed there ever since. That makes it impossible for the US to extend the category of proliferation to Israel. Not for military reasons, but for civilizational reasons. So proliferation is actually not the correct word, it's profanization which is the word, the profane, giving divine weapons to the non-sacred. Well, Iran is on the list for the non-sacred, according to them, not according to Iran. I belong to those who don't at all believe that Iran is struggling for a nuclear bomb but knowing their poker playing ability knowing Iran relatively well I think they enjoy every minute that other people believe it and will keep it going like that for some time at the same time as they of course are preparing other weapons now there is one more candidate civilization that is missing Buddhism and when India in 1898 detonated a particularly important nuclear device, which was not a device, quote-unquote, from 1971, but a real, honest-to-God bomb, then the code word for that bomb was Buddha has smiled. Buddhists didn't like that one. You can say that the Buddhist atomic weapon is an oxymoron. But uh, very aggressive Buddhisms, when Buddhism becomes a state religion, like Sri Lanka and Thailand, so one should not necessarily discard that possibility. So having said that, I would like to say some words about what does this mean. Of course, I'm not discarding the idea that it is also a military weapon. Let us look a little bit at what a military weapon is. If you follow Clausewitzian logic, you have a war for political goals. That means that there is a limit to how much you can destroy. Because if you destroy everything, and even make it radioactive, then what's the purpose? Well, to that, of course, the argument would be that you didn't have to take and possess Hiroshima. You could stay out Hiroshima and Nagasaki for radioactivity. You could take the rest of the country and make it submit. It was an easy job, given the Japanese inclination to do so, when the ultimate power from above had changed. But still, the destruction of the coveted property is a heavy argument against. The other argument against is, of course, the risk. And the risk is considerable. I remember in 1965, I wrote an essay, it was during the Cold War, saying that only an idiot would use missiles to distribute the bomb. Missiles are much too vulnerable. Of course, you can randomize their course like the latest Russian missiles, which are changing their course according to a table of random numbers that not even those who sent them know. But the ultimate course, the ultimate target is clear. In other words, they may be made less vulnerable. But it's a costly, difficult process. So I recommended suitcases. And the ideal suitcases, you would of course, when you have miniaturized a weapon, put in a locker at the railway station. And in that locker, you would have a remote control. 
You would then send a letter, but you would make it rather unclear who is the sender of the letter. And you would formulate your demands. You would also have a tripwire mechanism so that anybody who tried to identify the locker would ignite the bomb and they became sufficiently, let us say, close to the target. Now, in the National Public Radio yesterday, this was described 45 years later, after I had written it at least, as the permanent nightmare of the Pentagon. Because one basic problem would be, who is the sender? Now, there's something called nuclear forensics. In other words, you can investigate the signature left behind by the radioactivity. But the argument might also be that if the city in which it has been detonated has evaporated, then they might have other things to do than analyzing the signature. You can, of course, throw the bomb randomly, but that might also not be appreciated by others. In other words, we are dealing with a weapon that satisfies the condition that I see as essential namely the, the absolute weapon in defense of absolute value. It is not for conquest. It's essentially a defensive weapon. But it could also be for punishment. I regard as more or less ridiculous all the arguments put up in connection with the Hiroshima bomb. But I pay attention to is that it was fired, ignited over Hiroshima, almost exactly at the same hour as the Tora Tora Tora, the attack on Pearl Harbor. And it came from above. By that time, you're talking about 6 August 1945, Japan had capitulated. Final problem, the Tenno, the emperor status, had been solved by a very interesting compromise. And the compromise was that the tenor could continue, he would not be persecuted. He only had to do one thing, he had to resign from his divine status. Now that would make Japan non-divine. In other words, remove a basic condition for the nuclear weapon. That's interesting. And in a sense, I would say that whoever came up with that formula, and we know a lot about that, it was an extremely adequate way. Now, of course, the Tenno, when he went to the radio in order to denounce his own divinity, told the technician that I'm going to do that. But of course, nobody will believe me because they know I am divine. So we had a problem saying something that nobody would believe. It's not a pleasant task. We are dealing with essentials. So what follows from this? Well, the first thing that follows is that the US will not give up anything, nor will anybody else who has a bomb and has a civilization. The agreement signed in Prague it doesn't give up a single thing. It doesn't touch the enormous stepping up of the Department of Energy budget for nuclear arms, new nuclear arms. It doesn't touch the tripod. It doesn't touch the tactical weapon station in Europe. All it touches are some old-fashioned weapons that both sides want to get rid of. Some of them call monsters. They're too big. Their viability is also disputed. So they have a joint interest in getting rid of it. They will not give up anything. They will be very eagerly pursuing the NPT course. Not so much because of proliferation of the weapon as proliferation of divinity. In other words, the idea that others non-deserving could join that club. And the argument would be that they have nothing essential to defend. Since, as you will understand, I have seen the nuclear bomb for, above all, 
as a defensive weapon, but also as a punishment weapon after somebody has transgressed into the sacred. Hawaii was, of course, in 1941 the territory, but it was still a part of a sacred country. To attack that one was sacrilegious. So in spite of Japan having capitulated, God's punishment had to come. I don't know whether they did it that way, the way I would have done it if I were the priest ordaining this kind of thing, would be to go to the Old Testament, Numbers 16.35. The fires came forth from Jehovah's hand and burned up the 250 men who were offering incense. Now, the point is that it comes from above. It comes from above, and there were more than 250 people planning Pearl Harbor. But the idea was to make it very clear that they were in for punishment. I would guess that the others are thinking along similar lines. So let me now take this and go into the important thing. How do we get rid of the bomb? It's not at all impossible. Let me first say that it will never happen because of a multilateral conference. What I am comparing it with is slavery and colonialism. They were not abolished by multilateral conferences. Just to imagine that a club of slaveholders and a club of colonial powers would sit together and jointly abolish themselves defies any rationality. Not at all. What they will come up with is exactly the same as the Kyoto Agreement. Quotas. Some softening. They might also, if they had read the Kyoto Protocol, have come to the idea that you have a deficit of slaves, and I have quite a lot. Could you imagine that I get some of your quota? Or the same for colonialism. But at that time, which was not so mercantile as today, to put vice and sin on the market and distribute it as quotas, the mind was not sufficiently sick to come up with that idea. So I think the multilateral approach can safely be ruled out. It is not to be ruled out for non profanization treaty. That not. They don't want others to join the club. And too many are there already. Some might think. But the idea that they themselves should dig in a very, really meaningful way into their own arsenals. I think has never been thought in a serious way. So that raises the problem, if not multilateral, how could it happen? Well, the negation of multilateral is unilateral. Unilateral means that one country is the first. If we look at slavery as a model, it went through two stages. One was slave trade, abolition, the other one was abolition of slavery. When it comes to abolition of slave trade, I think the argument can be made that England played a role. About that role, I have oceans of things to say, I'll put that aside. Because since my concern is abolition of war as a social evil, I have a theory of the ten conditions under which social evils are abolished, and one of them is not multilateralism. Now, <clears throat> having said that, England played a role. By doing that, slavery was not abolished. And from an English point of view, it was a question of opportunity costs. They had discovered something much better than slavery. And there's something much better than slavery you could still exhaust the black man and woman. 
to attempt to work producing more black men and women, and in addition picking whatever they could pick. Well, it's a plantation in Africa. By doing that, and forcing them to pay for their upkeep and their protection by entering the monetized economy. They got rid of transportation expenses because it was in situ. They didn't need any transportation. By getting rid of that, they saved the enormous losses due to death in the voyage. And by doing that again, they could actually, from an opportunity cost point of view, make tremendous gains. Now, this system didn't last very long. As a matter of fact, colonialism in Africa actually lasted only about 60 years. About the same amount of time as they would give to development assistance, which is its legitimate child. A child whose father is Western imperialism, and whose mother is something Samaritan Christian, something in that direction, some compassion, and so on. So having said that, <coughs> England. England did not leave colonialism voluntarily, but it was the first to give it up. It might have happened without Gandhi, not very likely. But that much can be said, and I'd like to make two points. Gandhi was against caste, and he was against the British Empire. He has very harsh words about the British Empire, much stronger than I have about the US Empire in that book. Much stronger. And for some, that might even be a little bit too strong. But it says the U.S. Empire, it doesn't say the fall of U.S., it indicates the blossoming of the U.S. It was against caste and the empire. The Congress Party was not against caste. Not at all. The Congress Party consisted of Brahmins, Kshatriyas and Vaishyas. There were no Shudras high up in that, certainly no Paryas. They were against the empire because English colonials started arguing against caste, bringing English liberal values and human rights to India. The Congress Party got more and more worried about colonialism. Even if it had served them well, because positions in England and positions organized by British India were available to them. They wanted to get rid of the English Empire in order to get rid of that anti-caste voice. As a net result, they got Swaraj freedom and kept the caste. Brilliant social engineering. And they used Gandhi as an instrument to obtain that. They highly demoralized Gandhi when he understood where this was heading. So just given one perspective. Now this nonviolence made it more easy for England to capitulate. And with the capitulation in 1947, 15th of August, the crown jewel of the British Empire was gone, and the rest was a question of dominoes. With the British Empire gone, the others started falling. It's a question of dominoes. And the last one to fall, both for slavery and for colonialism, was Portugal. Now, when I look at the map of Europe, I also have a feeling <clears throat> that this is the small little boy back in the class who doesn't quite understand what's going on. <laughs> when the teacher is starting lecturing from that foggy island in the North Sea, things of that kind. So I'm very happy that Portugal doesn't have atomic weapons. They will be the last one to hold on to those two. Now this follows the scenario. Let me put it. If there was any way of moving England to drop atomic weapons, it would have an impact. I 
think that can only be done by consistent non-violence of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. England would be the mother of the Anglo-Saxons. I think it would have an impact on the US. It's also about the only country that would have an impact. By that I mean a moral impact. With Anglo-America starting a process, there could be a domino effect. Now, in this process, the kind of thinking that I have mentioned will not be available in documents. As a matter of fact, all of them will hire military experts and political scientists to design so-called rational arguments. And those rational arguments will hit the nuclear bomb and say it's not a good weapon cannot be used and should not be used. If you go back now to the rationalization in connection with the Hiroshima bomb, you will of course immediately remember some of them. Basic one was to save Yankee soldiers' lives, invading Honshu from Okinawa, starting with Kyushu, but much more was expected should they invade Honshu. The argument falls by its own lack of attention to history. The other argument is to frighten the Soviet Union and to tell the Soviet Union who is the master of the world. By August 1945, the situation was not that bad. That's one thing. I do not totally discard that one. But I think it works in a sense a somewhat different way. By invoking a weapon where you use the type of force that you imagine that God has at his disposal, you are of course declaring to the world who is closest to God. And you are in a sense taking upon your shoulder, yourself, the job that God should have done. God should have punished the Japanese by the methodology of Numbers uh, 1635. He should have done it, but you cannot rely on him for having time to do it, so you have to help him in a period of distress. And there's so many things to be punished in this world that God works over time. Now, I think that argument was 99 times more important than the Soviet argument. And the beauty of the argument was that it didn't have to be mentioned. Because everybody in that little room where Truman was the leader knew the argument in their intestines, in their gut brain. And when you're in a situation where you're in a crisis of complexity and you need consensus, the triple C condition, my general thesis, this is when the deep culture is in command. You had to show a consensus from the White House. There was a crisis, and the crisis was how to use the bomb before the war is over. A terrible crisis. And it was complex because there were all kinds of reasons in all that. In that case, if the deep culture comes up, there can be a nodding consensus around the table. Now, I've been present at meetings with Julia Hayop, where I have watched it. It's an interesting phenomenon. I can just take a very trivial example. When European politicians should find out what happened in Yugoslavia, there's no doubt that the Serbs were responsible. just wasn't even discussed. Now Yugoslavia is fairly complicated. There are many forces there. But the Serbs fitted the formula of being the closest force to Satan that you could find. So did the Japanese at the time. So what I am arguing is that the decision making has been at this level. 
the rationalization is at another level, and that's why we have political scientists is to write such documents. I have a PhD in such things. <coughs> and this will probably happen again. So I tried to put a finger at what to me is crucial, England. And the tradition in England is that brilliant middle class women, most of them living outside London, in cities, ideologically close to trade unions and the Labour Party, but also close to the Anglican Church, middle-aged, middle-classed, are the ones behind getting rid of slavery and getting rid of colonialism. Now, how many women of that type do we have? A couple of million. They did a fantastic job during the Cold War. Green, green and Commons. Fantastic. So it's a question of invigorating that again. Okay, that was my analysis. We will look at that. Um, what about North Korea and Al Qaeda? Um, you mentioned some of the big. I'll just leave it at that. What, what about these? Al-Qaeda has the religious motivation. There's no doubt about it. And uh, for that reason, they will feel very well with the bomb. So, so we have the non-proliferation forces against them. North Korea <coughs> is a different thing. Uh, when I talk with people in Pyongyang, which I've done often, I do not find traces of the deep culture I mentioned. What I find is that the Korean conflict, of course, is not between North Korea and South Korea. I think it never was. It's between North Korea and USA. And the USA correctly has identified North Korea as the major factor behind the decline of US empire from 1953 on that North Korea was so uneducated that they didn't understand that their task was to capitulate. A country that uppity has not yet received normalization and diplomatic relations. So it's punished by that. And put into a ridiculous six power conference, which is a kind of multilateralization of the issue, which will never succeed. Well, in this situation, given the extreme Han, the ressentiment in the Korean culture, they will go to very extreme measures. So this is not the civilization theory. This is an extremely pugnacious, extremely proud, and quite clever country at work. And their reasoning is, that we have beaten the US once, we manage it once again. Well, by beaten, they mean the US didn't win. It was the first war since 1812 that the US did not win. It started, of course, not in 1950, so you don't know history that you think. It started, to be quite precise, the 4th of May 1948, with the Jeju incident. And from that point on, it escalated. Uh, the Chinese probably came because the Russians had told them that this is interventionist war, it's against your revolution. They probably sent one million volunteers on court for the wrong reason. But having done it once, the alliance China-North Korea is relatively unbreakable. So I would see these are two different cases. Um, Question on, on North Korea. Um, during the time of the Sunshine Policy with Kim Dae-jung, um, it seemed tensions were cooler. And then when Bush came in, and he sort of escalated. Like, do you think if we would have continued with that, it would have been different now? Because North Korea just wanted no money and wheat and uh, launchings. There were other yeah. things that we could have. There is no doubt that Kim Dae-jung's policy was throwing hearts in Seoul and Pyongyang. No doubt about it. But there were two sets of hearts that were not sold. The 
set of heights in Washington and a set of heights in Tokyo. Not at all. And that killed it. Not George Bush 11, but the Tokyo Pacific. My Japanese wife has a thesis, which I find quite interesting, which is this, that when a country has committed an atrocity against somebody, and that country commits a mini atrocity. So a typical atrocity would be the whole Japanese occupation of Korea, with the US continuing in its shoes continuing, whereas the Soviet Union was withdrawing, the US continued in South Korea. That's the reason for the Jeju incident. When you do a thing like that, then the big atrocity country will pick up the small atrocity and live on that one. And these are, of course, the abduction of Japanese by North Koreans. Coming in submarines to the coast of Japan, abducting somebody. Presumably to get somebody who speaks Japanese perfectly in order to train interpreters or whatever it is, but uh, rather strange, rather strange. So Japan has been living on that one and make the maximum political capital out of it. I think for the Washington, the reason is just what I said. I've been to some of those meetings with Washington diplomats. And they have said, why do we negotiate any deal with North Korea? They're collapsing in the day. So Washington has issued collapse certificates for 60 years now, the daily collapse certificate. Now, if you are collapsing, you're not able to make a bomb. It's quite difficult. You may have some problem with heavy rains in the northern part of North Korea, six years in succession loosening enormous landslide covering a couple of million acres of soil. You may have that I'm uh, not saying that their own system is not also at fault. I'm just saying that this is a complex issue. Those sites were not sold. Kim De Jong, whom I had the pleasure of knowing personally, died a very disappointed man. Very disappointed. I was chairing a session last year, or about two years ago, when he was talking. And my wife knew that he loved some particular Japanese goodies. Some particular, not too different from Reagan jelly beans, actually. Actually, surprisingly close, in a sense. So we bought in Japan Kim the Jung's delicacy, and I had the pleasure of giving it to him. He had tears in his eyes. When I expressed in Japanese, uh, which I had in my instructed sentence, yeah, our extreme gratitude for the sunshine policy. Mm. Now he was great. He was great. Like all politicians, you make some mistakes. <laughs> and you may not be so clever in raising your sons and things of that kind. Otherwise, very well. The um, nuclear nonproliferation is really interesting. Mm. In, in the world of NGOs and abolition, there, there's a tension between nonproliferation and disarmament. And as you suggest what you're saying, or what I've been saying, there's a, a lot of psychological manipulation with language and words that they use. And non-proliferation means we keep ours, you don't get yours. Exactly. There's nothing, and the, I call it the nuclear provocation treaty, sort of like you, um, because it's, flaw, it's completely flawed. And for 40 years, everyone's been sort of playing this game and there's just a lot of like kind of group think and people going along with this. So some of the flaws in it, so you know of course all the activists and most of the human race want to completely eliminate nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. And then there are the forces that you know by smoke and mirrors and psychological manipulations um, get that. So there are two articles that are a problem. One is our article six of the NPT is that well, the, the deal in the NPT, which you may or may not know, is that um, Kennedy was very concerned about the spread of nuclear weapons and that he saw in a short time 25 countries or so could have them and that there would be total chaos and they had to do something as a global community to stop that. So they came up with the NPT 40 years ago. So the deal was that all the, the countries that do not have nuclear weapons will agree not to acquire nuclear weapons. And in exchange for that, 
the five countries then that had nuclear weapons said that they would um, make a commitment to negotiate in good faith toward total disarmament. And we never kept Article 6, so we violated it. So, And I spoke to someone who used to be a military person who's high up in a think tank. And when I mentioned that to him, Article 6, he said, oh, did anyone ever really believe that we were going to do that? So anyway, sorry, manipulative. The other problem is Article 4, which is the so-called inalienable right to so-called peaceful uses of nuclear technology. And they call atoms for peace and the peaceful atom. Right, and, and that's, I call it a trap, that Article 4 is a trap, nuclear power trap, T-R-A-P, toxic radioactive poison. Because as long as we have, and, and also the, they're called, like every, when you go to the NPT, you know, you're in the General Assembly the first day in every country, you have to hear 180 speeches through a plastic earphone, which human beings have never done for seven million years up until now. Um, and every country mindlessly mimics that we have the inalienable right to peaceful uses, the inalienable right to peaceful uses, and nobody questions that. Um, and also, by definition, it's not inalienable. But in an, I looked it up, inalienable right is a right that only the person whose right it is can renounce it. So if we're saying someone else can't have it, it's like air is an inalienable right, clean water is an inalienable right. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights are inalienable rights. Um, and I think everyone has an inalienable right to safe, non-toxic power with renewable and all that. So, um, so as long as we have Article 4, and it's like, it's just completely deeply ingrained in everybody's psyche that, except for all of the abolitionists and activists. So it's kind of an, a situation where everyone's together and they're mindlessly in this deep culture that's impossible to solve the problem with the, the kind of thinking that we have. And the other thing that, uh, and I'm working on drafts, is, is um, deterrence theory, which is flawed. And everyone says, we don't even call them nuclear weapons. We say we need a nuclear deterrent. And also maybe that we talk about conflict analysts, and this is where like we at least have to be conscious that, uh, that this is going on, because you can't intervene in the system if you're, if, if you're being mystified by it. Um, and Obama says, well, and this is sort of the, the mantra that as long as nuclear, we want to get rid of nuclear weapons, not in my lifetime, but as long as weapons exist, we will maintain a safe, reliable deterrent. And I'm working with um, Rob Green, former commander of the British Navy, who wrote The Naked Nuclear Emperor, challenging um, deterrence theory. But he, he says that deterrence is a crazy scheme for, to make nuclear war less likely by making it more likely. And Ban Ki-moon said that deterrence is such a good idea that it's become contagious. And there's also a spiral model. So anyway, I've, I wonder if you could comment on some of these things, or anybody. You know, this is a very rich field. And of course, what you said doesn't prove my point, but it is compatible with my point. Okay. And so what I say is that you have a double, at least a double layer to decision-making process. You have one deep down, civilizational, the absolute weapon, because you represent an absolute value. Instead of the word inalienable, I actually often use non-negotiable. Because non-negotiable is something you cannot put on the table and give away, and it's absolute. And behind that. And then on the other hand, you have all the kind of military doctrines, including deterrence theory. Including what? Deterrence, deterrence theory. theory. I think it is probably true that nuclear arms deterred nuclear war. By doing that, it put the threshold of acceptable war so high that it facilitated the proliferation of non-nuclear war. You see, it's a little bit like the function that Hitler has had in history. Because of his atrocities, other countries can commit atrocities as long as they don't come up to his limit. I could now say a lot about what Israel does. 
But the argument would always be that there were no gas chambers and they didn't kill them that way, you see. So that as long as you have a threshold up there that you denounce, then you have free space lower down. So my answer has always been to this one, that nuclear weapons deter nuclear weapons. And the but purpose of nuclear weapons is to not use them. Uh, that's well, that's a little bit different. A little bit that's different. a little bit different. I think it is true that both Soviet Union and the United States, particularly the United States, might have been tempted to use nuclear arms during the Cold War, but didn't dare uh, because the other one. I think there is something to that argument. But what they did instead was an enormous amount of local wars, particularly by the Western powers. What the US did is summarized very often by the famous telephone number that you have to call in Moscow when you want brotherly intervention, brotherly assistance. And the telephone number is 53, 56, 68, 79. It's an eight digit that stands for the East German action, the Polish action, the Czech action, the Hungarian action, I mean, the invasion of Czechoslovakia and the invasion of Afghanistan. But as many people pointed out, the corresponding telephone number in the United States would have about 60 digits. So it becomes too long, you cannot even write it on the blackboard. This took place very often under the argument that it's not nuclear. So we have a kind of double-edged thing there. However, this disappears under the present conditions. The argument disappears because it presupposes that you have a clear state system. Where you know who the threat, where the threat is, whence the threat comes, and you know who the sender is. If you're not up against another state, <coughs> but you're up against an UMA, the community of the believers, that may define Al-Qaeda as the base, which is the translation of the Arabic word. If you're up against that one, <coughs> you would not know where it comes from. Besides, I cannot repeat often enough that I think the method of delivery is by suitcase and not by missile. So, it's a question of managing that. It seems to me not very easy, not very difficult. Uh, that, of course, brings to me the conclusion, which is the obvious conclusion. There is no way to peace through disarmament. Um, also, disarmament is not a road to peace. Peace is the road to disarmament. And peace is something you get the moment you understand the underlying conflict. And you're able to see that conflict from above, including seeing yourself. And then try to find the mediating formula. Uh, the Orange Book, there is about 100 cases on that, including Afghanistan, Iraq, the war on terror, and so on. Uh, but that capacity, I know no country in the world but that capacity is so undeveloped as the United States of America. So totally incapable of analyzing what 9-11 was about. It's even forbidden to do it. Yes. Yeah. Even forbidden to do it. It's taboo. The person who comes a little bit close is Maureen Dowd. A woman, of course. A courageous woman. She had, in an article from Saudi Arabia, she had a sentence which was almost close to the target, almost right on. She scored about 8 out of 10. It's the only thing I have seen. And it has taken almost 10 years, even for a Maureen Dow to write a sentence. And what was the sentence? Yeah, no, we leave that as a <coughs> This is about nuclear proliferation. It's too advanced for an American senior. <laughs> so uh, clearly the, um, uh, the thread through your argument uh, is a theological one uh, and it, it, it's, it sounds like an, arg uh, an argument uh, uh, 
of idolatry. That is to say, it's an argument against idolatry. Um, and I think of idolatry as being fueled by, or idolatries as being fueled by a combination of pride, fear, uh, fear fueling practic practical argument. We have to do this because uh, God isn't acting on our behalf, and therefore we have to. Uh, God has abandoned us. That, that, that sort of argument. Um, with that as a frame, or your, your, with your frame as a frame, what, and you may have just answered this to some degree, that, you can, that we can't get through disarmament, um, we have to go through peace. But what would you say, theologically, about approaching through peace, approaching disarmament through peace? That's of course, let me just rephrase it a little bit what please, you said. Please. Uh, my argument is not theological. My argument is that I use theology as a part of what to me is a realistic analysis. And I find the analysis in terms of uh, proliferation and uh, the articles you mentioned and the, ar the arguments I mentioned in connection with the August 1945 jazzy and out of touch with reality. As a social scientist, I want to touch reality. Yes. Now, theological factors are a very important part of reality. And uh, you mentioned, I think, very correctly, arguments like fear. But I think there is also a love of God in it, mm. and a sense of duty. And that by bombing Pearl Harbor, it's not a question of the US fleet that went down. It's not a question of that. It's a question of transgressing into sacred territory. And God loves us, we are his chosen people. And it is our duty and right, our pleasant right, to stand up and do what is commanded of us. And that was done. So I would only like to add to the fear, which is very important, namely the fear that God may desert us and no longer be behind us, no longer support us. And that, of course, has been a very important argument in connection with the Vietnam War, and it's still an important argument. In connection with the three wars that the U.S. is now losing, the war on terror, the war in Iraq, and the war in Afghanistan. So that means a rather severe argument against those who think that they have God's support as a chosen people. Let me only add <laughs> that the evangelicals are rather important. Uh, well, the last thing George Bush did, according to very reliable sources I have, was to substitute generals in Pentagon to increase the percentage of evangelicals among the generals. And of course, you all know about the truckloads of idols behind the uh, more military things, you know, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, to try to convert the Taliban to Christianity, uh, <laughs> kind of uphill job, I think. It <laughs> uh, takes some quite heroic sentiment to do that. But I wouldn't call it fear. I would rather call it devotion. In a sense. It's a devotion totally devoid of any knowledge of what goes on in the world, but uh, that's another matter. And narcissism? There's an element in it. <laughs> element in it. Element in it. But you see, it's a little bit too psychologistic for me, Diana, because if you feel that God loves you, that you mentioned the word pride, which is very important. It gives you pride, but it gives you also the fear that he may stop loving you. You have a covenant with God. I mean, nobody has analyzed this better than Bob Benham mm. in his book's fantastic analysis of it. And the broken covenant broken covenant and of course uh, on board a ship on board a Mayflower got a martyr sermon that the Jews have broken the covenant but we will never make it. Uh, important, important words. Uh, to me it's also very important that this happened a century before enlightenment. In other words the foundation of the US was a pre-enlightenment thing and has remained that way to a large extent. Has a kind of mysticism, almost medieval, with a lot of modernity to it, no doubt about that, including atomic weapons. 
but it would have been quite interesting if they had waited 100 years. And maybe it would also have been good if it hadn't been the Puritans from East Anglia, via Leiden, who played such a leading role. But leaving that aside, we cannot redo that. Um, I do not count on any initiative from the US, but I some help from England. On that, on that note that about the middle class, middle aged women, what's it going to take for for that process to actually move forward? It, <coughs> I, this is really interesting. I don't know. Uh, so May 14, I'll be at Oxford University. They, they do something which they do every three years, is to restart an effort to have peace studies at Oxford. <laughs> and, uh, it's something they, and, and it fails for the same reason as it fails at Harvard and so on. It's not what they, uh, honest to God, Anglo-Saxon imperial power is supposed to have, you know, but it's key universities. Leave that to, to, to Bradford or something like that. But, uh, or to some Mennonite college uh, somewhere. But uh, the fascinating thing about it is uh, that this is the topic of my talk. Mm. I'm trying to make that argument. Just an argument as an example of a fantastic growth for England. So you got out of me. They don't know it, you know it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's important. I mean, it's a little bit when you look at the fact, I mean, who were the ones who stimulated public consciousness about slavery? Well, had it been Tristau, a woman, like a who did the same job for war, but upon Zutner, down with the arms. And you find these extremely brilliant women who have set a tone in male society, have considerable risk to themselves. And you can now critique Uncle Tom's cabin, you can talk about Uncle Tomism, and yet it was an extremely important. And you find green and commons, you find the same. But much of the energy went out with the end of the Cold War, because the imminent danger of nuclear war was declared over. Yet, I nevertheless want to add what to me is my major point, which is not this point. There's no substitute for computer solution. Simply seeing what the conflict is about, and then try to see, couldn't there be a reasonable solution to this? Yeah, I think there is to Iraq, to Afghanistan, but that's the next Friday in Washington. Um, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. 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 Yeah, we may do a workshop maybe. next maybe. Friday. Um, but on the point of conflict resolution, um, I've been going, you know. You know, every year at the NPTs in New York, and I, some woman from Greenham Commons or Rebecca Johnson is very active in, in this group. And everyone is about, he said, the peace is the way to disarmament, but ironically, the peace, and um, this question is about the peace movement, because the peace movement is all about getting rid of the symptom, getting rid of the weapons. And I've been sort of working every year to try to work on, get um, presentations in on dealing with the underlying conflicts. And you said the peace movement is the worst enemy or something? No, I didn't no, 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 I don't want to say, I don't want, no, I don't, don't, no, I don't what I have said. You, you, you said, well, <laughs> Just to the, the, the peace movement what I have is pretty much on how to. As a peace researcher, I had a sort of, I shouldn't use that expression, kind of two-front thing going on. One is that to the foreign ministries and other one to the peace movement. I find them very similar. Mm -hmm. Could you say more? Though? Pretty much the same way. How? Way. I mean, there is, of course, a difference that one is willing to use war and that one is not willing to do it. But when it comes to ability to analyze conflict and find the right. solutions, I find them very simple. Right. And most it's of the speeches are just how terrible, that they're horrible and they're terrible and we have to get rid of them. <coughs> the, um, yeah. There's been some conversation at uh, ICAR recently, at least in the classes I've been part of, um, about whether and some hallway conversations uh, about whether the terms um, conflict resolution, conflict transformation, 
perhaps even the distinction between conflict resolution and peace studies are beginning to blur to the point of needing to be broken down. <coughs> um, at least I think that the, some of the faculty here are seeing, uh, are, are wanting to have a, a, um, a broader scope uh, understood by, those, by, by the terms we tend to use here. But I wonder what your perspective is on that, coming from the mm. peace studies perspective. I think it's rather simple. Rather simple? Rather simple. I mean, conflict, uh, conflict, violence, and peace. First of all, violence and peace are related very much like disease and health. Now, conflict is an important factor generating violence. But it can also be handled in such a way that it can generate peace. Conflict is a challenge. Uh, you cannot detach them from each other. They are not two separate fields of studies. They're just uh, different parts of the process. I used to say when, I, when people ask me what is this peace studies thing about it, if I am in a helicopter and I see something called Peace Landia, then I discover three parts of it mm -hmm. called past, present, future. The past has to do with trauma. The present has to do with conflict, and the future has to do with projects. Now, for traumas, we have conciliation. For conflicts, we have mediation. And for projects, we have peace building. Now, these three are inseparable from each other. And uh, I've noticed in ICA there's a kind of artificial division between peace studies and conflict resolutions, mm -hmm. coming out of traditions from the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So I try to say that. If I could just follow up, one, one of the techniques, of course, that, that we, we study, uh, appreciative inquiry, seems to me to start with the, uh, with the principle which I hear in peace studies, which is to start with what's working. Uh, you know, tell a story about uh, your best experience of something, and then build on, on that. Is that, is that a locus for peace studies, to begin with what's working? It's a very American way of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm culturally, way, I'm culturally it's identified. It's a very American way of doing it. <laughs> very American. Could you, could you say A little bit philosophy and thinking, yeah. in addition to that, my belief. How so? Yeah. But I think that's outside our topic. Today. <laughs> Thank you. I could recommend you some books if you want some reading about it. Well, actually, I um, fifteen dollars a piece. I, I just want to say, if you don't mind, after nine eleven, when I would have conversations with people, whenever I said uttered the term conflict resolution, like their eyes would glaze over and the conversation would end. So I stopped using the term, and I actually like and what I learned from you. I like conflict transformation. I think it's different because you create a new reality, yeah, and that includes the opposites and transcends the yeah, I, mean, I guess there's the idea of transcendent function, but, um, which is different than compromise. And I think conflict resolution is more like compromise. Not necessarily, but conflict resolution has something final to it, oh. that it has been resolved. I define conflict transformation as you take a conflict and you uproot it and replant it somewhere else. Right. You replant it in such a way that the parties can handle it. <laughs> but you don't have the illusion that the conflict is over. There's no such thing as post-conflict. Right. I, uh, I was consultant to the World Bank and the ASEAN Secretariat uh, last week, just uh, eight days ago, in Jakarta. And it was about the World Bank report, the World Development Report for 2011. So to my mind, a hopeless document development, security, and conflict, and fragility, and all kinds of things. And you see, the problem boils down to one thing, that the Anglo-American conceptualization of conflict is very close to violence. So when the violence is over, you have a post-conflict situation. It doesn't open for a transformation where you work on it. You work on it. I mean, everybody who is married knows that 
conflicts go on, but you can transform them. You can use them productively. They don't disappear. disappear. Somebody will wake up early in the morning and say, I remember what you did 20 years ago. <laughs> it isn't like that. So in the conflict resolution, is something unrealistic from that point of view. And yet the world is, uh, should be kept, I think. Should be kept. So having said that, <coughs> Uh, um, when it comes to 9-11, um, one has to talk a little bit. One has to talk with Al-Qaeda people and Taliban and Hamas and Hezbollah. I've done that. And when I say that to American diplomats, <laughs> tell me. So there's a combination of shock and enormous curiosity. Enormous curiosity. And I tell them, what I even talked with people in State Department, so I go quite far when it comes to terrorists, state terrorists. No, these are human beings, and very often they don't see in and out. And my experience is that in order to see in and out, you have to take that helicopter sweep a little bit up mm -hmm. and see it from above. It looks different. I have another point. Does anyone have any questions? When we talk about, we well said, you know, having a return, if we get a bomb, if there's a return address, then therefore we will retaliate. But I think the word retaliate doesn't even apply because we're talking about, you know, killing and harming millions of, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people, innocent, completely innocent people that have nothing for the misfortune of having bad leaders. So, like, if I, and I, retaliation is an eye for an eye, a two for a two. It's not like I kill your whole village because you did something. Anyway, the, we use this language in a way like, oh, retaliation, of course. We're, you know, we have a right to defend ourselves. And, um, so <clears throat> if uh, one of these bombs in a suitcase parked at uh, Pennsylvania Station and uh, it's not obvious that anybody would claim it and tell you where they are. And so if they did? It? What do you do? Yeah. Yeah, if they do, then you have an address. Well, but, but if we retaliate, we're killing innocent people. Yeah. You see, that has been done. 9-11. There is still absolutely not a single item of proof that 9-11 was planned in Afghanistan. And yet, American politics is based on that. Cannot be repeated often enough. A leading CIA person, an FBI person, who control what they just said. And they were as hectically trying to find the proof when they invaded Afghanistan on 7 October 2001, and still trying to find it they were trying to find weapons of mass destruction by 19 or March 2003, they made it So the idea of retaliating is the wrong place. That, of course, places the question of the correct place, probably Hamburg. And Hamburg is used to being bombed, and the Americans are trained in bombing it, together with the Allies. So that should be an easy trip. <coughs> but it would be problematic. So we never had nine years of maneuvering in this field. Instead of trying to find out what is Al Qaeda about and what do they want. Seems to me a much more productive way. And they and they even offered a truce. That's how the line offered. A truce. Yeah. At some point today. And um, we said, oh he's well, you come very close by reading that excellent book with Osama bin Laden's 26 first speeches. <laughs> Which, of course, is a bit of reading. But, uh, I understand, I don't know Arabic, but I understand that this Arabic is extremely flammable and beautiful. And it's a condition for each in the Arab life. Obama could be, Osama Obama. Uh, 
So it's a secret Obama Osama meeting. Of course, the Tea Party would have a fit with that. <laughs> the Tea Party? <coughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't like them. I'm fascinated with Sana Payne, in particular, with Mexicans. I'm just fascinated with them since she's been the 46th president, just as when we finished with them. Um, any other I repeat, I don't think the situation is hopeless. I think there are ways to go, and these ways have succeeded before. But they take time. They are time consuming and require lots of work for common people. I indicated very briefly that there is another way to go. And that's to denounce the religious mystique on which, for instance, Israel and the U.S. are based. The whole idea of chosen people. And um, my final word, one person who did that in a very positive way, I have forgotten his name, but he's the Archbishop of the Catholic Church in Oakland. And he's the one who wrote the booklet against the bomb for the Catholic Church. Uh, the bishop's letter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the 80s? 1983, yeah. exactly. And there was a corresponding Methodist. There were two, two of them. They were very, very well, very, very well. And I was on the podium with the authors. And I said, when I read your admirable book, it's not really about nuclear weapons, is it? It's about God. And he said, of course it is about God. I you know nothing about nuclear weapons. I know about God. <laughs> yeah, well, that, uh, to me, is a little bit problematic, but we left that aside. Um, that's called theology, knowledge of God. And I know, he said, that God did not create us for us to destroy each other and disappear in radioactive ashes. We were created to love each other. It was an act of love. I find that way of thinking beautiful. Just beautiful. Now I'll try that on the Southern Baptist Convention at <laughs> that annual meeting and see how it comes out. See how it washes through. There are Christianities and Christianities, and I can share with you that there are Taliban and I'm Taliban. Many people have